My name is Todd Amick. I'm the president of the New Evangelization Society. Uh, I'm honored to be able to welcome you here at Notre Dame Seminary and to thank uh, Father James Wayne, uh, who's once again is very gracious in, uh, in opening up the seminary for us. I also want to thank Mr. Tony Locks, whose logistics support and diligence allows uh, for the NES to continue to be for there to be no hiccups, no bumps. Uh, tonight also we're going to be welcoming uh, Dr. James, uh, James Jacobs, uh, who's going to help us to understand a little bit better what new evangelization is, uh, both through the exercise of, of reason, the word of reason, as well as, as, as being open to the, the gifts of faith. Dr. James Jacobs has taught at Notre Dame Seminary since 2003. He grew up in Anaheim, California, and then earned a BA in philosophy from Harvard University, an MTS from the Franciscan School of Theology in Berkeley, and a PhD in philosophy from Fordham University. He specializes in the law of Thomas Aquinas, particularly natural law and ethics. Dr. Jacobs has had articles published in such journals as the American Catholic Philosophical Quarterly, the International Philosophical Quarterly, and NOAA. <coughs> Tonight, uh, Dr. Jacobs is going to help us to better understand what it is to know God through faith and reason, so that we might open our minds and our hearts to his revelation in both of the books that he offers and help others to be able to do that. Thank you very much. Please help us welcome Dr. James. Uh, first, a comment about the, uh, the handout. That's not directly pertinent to anything I'm going to say tonight, but I thought that was a good illustration of the idea of the many ways we can prove the existence of God. That Peter Kreef has a uh, short version of the Summa Theologia called the Summa the Summa. And when he takes, uh, when he gets to Thomas's arguments for the proofs for the existence of God, he gives this long two-page footnote in which he lists what is something like 30 different proofs for the existence of God. I just thought that might be a helpful resource for you in the future. Um, so I just thought that was an interesting side point, but I'm not really going to reference that directly. Given the widespread hostility in contemporary society, and especially in academia, to the idea that belief in God is rational, how can we even assume that the, the idea that God exists has something to do with reason? And there are three points at which we can show that the idea that God exists is in fact a rational claim. First, the idea that God exists is a meaningful idea. When we say it, people know what we mean. It's not like saying all the board groves are mimsy, as Lewis Carroll said, that's nonsensical. God exists is a claim that everybody understands. Whether or not they agree with it, they understand it, so it's a meaningful statement. Secondly, if it's meaningful, it must have some true value. If it's an idea that everybody understands, it is something that is either true or false. It can't be something that is neither true nor false as a meaningful claim. And then third, if it is true or false, there has to be some means of proof for that idea. There has to be some mode of evidence for it. And I'll take each of these objections up one by one. We'll spend most of our time with the third one, with the question with respect to evidence for the existence of God. The first one, that God exists, is sometimes questioned in modernity because there are some people who say that it's not even a meaningful statement. This is famously the position of the British philosopher David Hume, who was an 18th century thinker, and was revived very uh, strongly in the 1920s and 1930s by a group called the Logical Positivists, whose influence carried on in America all the way through the 1970s. Now, the reason they say that it's not even a meaningful statement is that they claim that every meaningful statement has to have some reference back to a direct sense experience. So if I say the chair is blue, well, I have an experience of what blue is, so it's meaningful. If I say the tree is tall, I can have an experience of what tallness is, so that's meaningful. But they say that God exists, well, nobody has sense experience of God. And because we don't have sense experience of God, it cannot be a meaningful statement. There are a couple of problems with, with this position. First, there are all sorts of statements that all of a sudden become utterly meaningless. So for example, statements about the future future obviously does not exist yet, you can't have sense experience of the future, so they become inherently meaningless. And this famously in Hume undermined, uh, Hume uses that to undermine scientific prediction. Also, any value statement becomes inherently meaningless. So that something is beautiful, or that something is good, 
is not meaningful because you, there's no sense experience of beauty. If I look at a painting, I can say, well, it's blue or it's big or it's uh, uh, angular. But the idea of beauty is not something that's inherently experienced. Also, the idea of moral goodness, right? To say that something is good, well, what exact moral, uh, excuse me, what exact sense experience does that trace back to? This idea that value statements have no meaning is attacked, if you want a good uh, attack on that, the first chapter of C.S. Lewis's book, The Abolition of Man, takes that up directly. Um, more importantly, when it comes to the question of ethics, to say that ethics is a meaningless statement, well, how do you defend that, especially after the Holocaust? Right? So the, all the British academic philosophers and the American academic philosophers in the Ivy League were saying that, well, ethical statements have no meaning. It's just the idea that if I say something is good, I like it. If I say that it's bad, I don't like that. And this is what they were arguing in the 30s and 40s. But how do you say that the Holocaust is evil doesn't have any meaningfulness to it? So that after the Holocaust, that mode of argumentation becomes increasingly uh, marginal and difficult to make. More importantly and more finally, the idea that all propositions have to refer to an empirical experience, have to refer to back to some sense of experience, does it, itself does not refer to any empirical experience. Right? So it's a kind of self-contradictory position. So if I say something is true only if I can have an exper empirical experience of it, well, I don't have an empirical experience at all true statements are based upon empirical experiences. So it's a self-contradictory position, and so that falls down. So to, to say that the idea that God exists is not meaningful, although that's been held on and off in philosophy over the last 200 years, is not a very tenable position these days. The second position is that some say that God exists is neither true nor false. It's merely a subjective belief that is useful to me or useful to you, but it cannot uh, have any objective truth value. This is the position of the German philosopher Immanuel Kant, uh, who is a terribly influential philosopher. He, was, uh, he died in the uh, early 19th century, but he's, he's the, the ghost behind all sorts of modern ideas that we have to contend with. Kant's idea was, again, based upon the idea that what we know is science. And if something's not directly provable by science, we can believe it as long as it's useful to me. This turns religion into a kind of therapy. Something is true because it makes me feel good. Something is true because it helps me deal with the world. Um, I just last weekend went to my 25th college reunion, and they had a symposium for graduates, one of which was on our, the development of our spiritual lives. And it was really disheartening, me, disheartening for me to see that everybody who spoke about religion talked about it in these terms. Right? Religion is neither true nor false, it's just something that helps you get along in the world. Well, there are a series of problems with this. First off, it makes religion utterly relativistic, that uh, what is true for you could be not true for me, and um, therefore you have contradictory ideas that are simultaneously true, right? So the Christian holds that Jesus is the Son of God, the Muslim holds that Jesus is not the Son of God, and you can't say, just say, well, everybody believe what you want, because then there would be no truth statement to whether or not Jesus is the Son of God. But clearly, that claim is something that has a truth quality to it. Either Christ is the Son of God, or he is not. Secondly, if they're not true or false, then all religions are the same. This is, again, something that you may have heard. Uh, that, well, it doesn't matter what you believe, but all religions really just help you be a good person. And again, this is the idea that religion is just there to help us be moral, to kind of be a therapy in dealing with life, but is itself uh, not, neither true nor false. Uh, because of this, because of the indifference with respect to the truth of doctrine, Kant himself admitted in one of his later works that each person creates their own God. Right? If God is simply something to help me get along in this world, then I create the God that is most useful for me. You create the God that is most useful for you. Well, the biggest problem with this, I think, is that, is this really a road to salvation? Right? We find ourselves in a world where we're torn by our original sin, and that we know that we cannot lift ourselves out of it. And if I know that my idea of God is merely a fiction that I've created for a kind of therapeutic help in this world, I can't rely on that to guide me to salvation. 
So that really weak idea that religion is just merely something I believe in order to help me along, that also cannot be the essence of religion because we know that religion is supposed to be a means for salvation. Third, some people say that God exists as a false claim because there's inadequate evidence to support the conclusion. Here, our response is that there is evidence for the existence of God, and this evidence for the ex existence of God is both in terms of reason and in terms of faith. Since truth is truth, and no truth can contradict the truth, faith cannot contradict reason. So that the evidence we have on the basis of reason and the evidence that we have on the basis of faith must coincide. But moreover, it's the evidence on reason that establishes the parameters for the evidence given by faith. Because we have universal, all mankind have universal access to reason, the truths that we get by reason establish the ultimate boundaries with which faith then brings us past reason into the real supernatural understanding of what God is. And the rest of this discussion tonight will try and fill, that, fill out that position. This obviously brings up the deeper question of what constitutes rational evidence. Many people today have a scientific bias where they'll assume that the only valid evidence for something has to be something that is related to science. So, for example, Carl Sagan, the great physicist, who was, who was indeed a great physicist, but was kind of a religious idiot, once said that the only evidence that he would take for God was something like a huge uh, decalogue on the face of the moon. Right? The only evidence he could take was something that science could prove. And so what we have to discuss is to see that rationality is not coextensive with science. Science is one mode of gathering evidence, but it's not the only mode of gathering evidence. Rationality as a whole means finding unintelligible causes, causes for what we experience in the world. And that historically, this has not been restricted to science, but included philosophy. The problem is, is that about the year 1600, when modernity begins, they, uh, the philosophers decide for, for a number of reasons that knowledge can only be restricted to that which is utterly certain, meaning that which can be proved absolutely, and to that which is useful to know. Well, if you're talking about that which can be proved absolutely, you're more or less restricting yourself to the world where you can perform experiments, and that marginalizes philosophy. But I think more importantly, the idea that knowledge is power, as Francis Bacon put it, the idea that knowledge is only knowledge that gives us control over the world, also does harm to the idea that philosophy counts as knowledge. Because philosophy allows you to know the highest truths, to contemplate, contemplate the greatest realities. But that doesn't necessarily give us control of the world, and in fact, it does the exact opposite. Because if you know the highest truths, your only real reaction to is yes, amen, and you bow your head in obedience. You don't use that to try and control the world. But if you ignore that there are any truths higher than the material world, and you think that the material world is handed over to man so that we can man manipulate it for our purposes, and that this allows us not only to have power over the world, but certain power, then you're going to reconceive what constitutes knowledge. And this is what's been happening over the last 400 years. And what we have to do tonight and in the, per in the process of the new evangelization is to recover that ancient idea that knowledge isn't just scientific. Knowledge is scientific, but more importantly, knowledge is that wisdom of knowing truth that go beyond and behind the scientific. So, I've said that we can know uh, God both by faith and by reason. But the first point we need to make is that faith and reason approach God in different ways. Philosophy will get to God by observing nature and seeking the intelligible causes of things. Thus, we see that there's a universe that's existing that didn't have to exist, and we know that the universe is ordered in a way so as to imply that there is an order behind it. And then we can argue to the fact that there is a creator of this universe. 
Now, what philosophy gets us to is the idea simply that God is the creator of the world. But that's a very limited idea of God, and it certainly doesn't tell us everything we want to know about God. This is where theology comes in. Theology begins with revelation. Theology begins with what we get in scripture and the tradition, and then applies that to everything else to make sense of it. Now, theology has to make use of reason in three ways in this process. First, theology does have to go back to what philosophy has said about God. As I said before, reason will give us the parameters or the rules for understanding how God can be. So uh, theology first refers back to those basic parameters that we get through philosophy about the way God must be. Secondly, theology uses philosophy to articulate the faith to make sense of it. So in the Gospel, at the end of the uh, Gospel of Matthew, we have this, the uh, admonition, go out and baptize the whole world in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Well, when the theologians come to that, they say, well, what does this mean? Are there three gods or are there one? And we know that being a, a good Jewish people, the early Christians said, no, there is only one God. So how can we baptize people in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit? So they begin to work with, it, with this, and they eventually come to the realization, well, it's three persons in one nature. But the idea of a person is a philosophical category. The idea of nature is a philosophical category. So even to make sense of what we get in Revelation, you do have to import uh, philosophical categories to make sense of it. Um, and it's interesting, I've read some articles in the last few years about how a lot of the uh, reformers in the 15th century famously threw out philosophy completely, and they've had to go back and rebuild the wheel because they find themselves having to, to say, well, I'm not going to use philosophy at all, how do I make sense of scripture? And they realize you have to use philosophy to make sense of scripture. Um, the third way that theology uses philosophy is then to find a deeper understanding of the faith. And this is where have people like St. Thomas and St. Bonaventure and St. Augustine create their great th theological works explaining all the details of the faith and giving a justification for the, what we believe. What we believe is given to us in Revelation, but this is where they justify it and explain it more fully. Now you might ask that, I've said that we can know God in terms of philosophy. Why do we need revelation at all? Why do we need theology? Why do we need faith? And St. Thomas takes this up in the very first question of the Summa Theologia, that before you write this 3,000 page works of work expounding the Catholic faith, the first thing he does is to say, why do I even need theology? Isn't philosophy good enough? And he says very pointedly, there are two reasons why we need theology, why we need revelation. The first is that even those things that philosophy can get to about God are known by very few people after a long time and with a lot of error. So brilliant men like Socrates and Plato and Aristotle spent their whole life thinking about God. But even at the end of their lives, they still didn't get God right at all. There's still a lot of errors in their notion of God. But frankly, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle had it easy. They didn't have to work for a living. They were a philosopher like myself. And so, for those people who actually have to do something, they don't have the leisure to simply think about God. And so in order to guarantee that everybody can know these truths about God, it was revealed in the Bible. But beyond that, even beyond those things that we can know about God through philosophy, there are also things that we could never know about God. These are things like that God is the Trinity that Jesus Christ is the incarnate Word of God, that He became incarnate through a virgin birth, that He was resurrected from the dead. These are things that go beyond reason and that reason could never understand. Uh, Eddie and Jill Song, who's a great Thomistic philosopher of the 20th century, once commented very succinctly, faith lies at the end of no syllogism. I could make all sorts of arguments about God, but that won't get me to the Catholic faith. The Catholic faith about God and Christ, about the Trinity and, and uh, Jesus Christ, are only knowable by means of revelation. There are a couple good historical illustrations of this. If you've ever read the, Conf the Confessions of St. Augustine, in Book 8 of the Confessions, he's sitting there 
and he's trying to figure out why he hasn't believed yet. He's got it in his head. He understands it. He has the Catholic doctrine, but he hasn't believed yet. And then what he has, what he needs is the gift of faith. And so although he's figured out all the philosophical aspects of it, he needs that last step of faith. And that's what finally leads to his famous conversion, where he hears somebody say, Tole lege, pick up and read. And he picks up and reads from a letter, of, uh, a letter to the Romans. And that leads him to his conversion. Another famous example is the, uh, the 20th century philosopher Mortimer Adler. Mortimer Adler was a philosopher who started to work in Aristotle. And because he worked in Aristotle, he did some work in St. Thomas, and he became a great defender of the existence of God. But throughout his life, he considered himself a pagan because he was neither Jewish nor Christian, although he had been born a Jew. He was neither Jewish nor Christian. He believed in a purely philosophical idea of God, and he was a great scholar of Thomas's works. And somebody asked him when he was 90 years old, why haven't you joined the church yet? It's clear that you believe. And he says, well, you know that faith is a gift. And it's not something, it's not something that I can argue myself into. And thankfully, when he was about 95 years old, he was given the gift of faith and he was baptized and brought into the church. So it's a remarkable testimony to the idea that in addition to all the philosophical truths that we can get, you also need that gift of faith that takes you beyond that to the mysteries of God. That whole fact is articulated in the ancient Catholic doctrine that grace perfects nature. What we get through philosophy is a natural understanding of God. And what we get through revelation is the grace of, of, of God's own knowledge of himself by which he leads us to the complete truth. One last small digression before I get to the main topic. And this is the idea that when we claim to know God, we use words and we use concepts but we have to be very careful the way we consider our use of these words and concepts. Words point to kinds of beings, tables, dog, uh, tables, chairs, birds, dogs, cats, trees. Concepts are correlated to those words. But God, and Baron pointed this out very well, I think, in his uh, video, God is not a kind of being. God is being itself, ipsum subsistence essay subsistent being itself. The only appropriate response is one of fear. And I think that this was the point that Pope Benedict pointed out in uh, the famous Regensburg speech, if you recall that, where he quoted a, a medieval uh, emperor who said that, um, well, the problem with Islam is that God is not limited either by the ideas of truth or goodness. Islam has this exalted, transcendent idea of God. But because God is so alien and so other, their only response is one of submission, right? Islam means submission. And it's one of fear. Whereas the Judeo-Christian tradition is a relationship of love because, because we know God's name, Yahweh. That is, that's not the way that uh, the Islamic tradition points to it. And so if we're going to form a relationship of love, again, God can't be simply alien. He has to be something that we know and we understand and can believe in. The other extreme, though, is to say that when we use words about God, it means exactly the same thing. So that when, when I say that God loves me and my wife loves me, I'm just talking about the same thing. Maybe God does so more, but it's not inherently different. Or when Socrates is just and God is just, it means simply the same thing. The problem with this is that it makes God just like everything else in the universe. And the problem is that God is not like another thing in the universe. God is completely apart from the universe because he creates the entire universe. If you say that God is just another thing in the universe, it causes a great deal of problems because if you can account for something by means of a natural cause doing it, then there's nothing else for God to do, right? So if you say that it's genetics that causes the origin of life, well, there's nothing else for God to do because you've given already one imminent or worldly explanation. If God's just another thing in the universe, he doesn't have anything else to do. And so this idea, which is the technical term for this, is a univocal idea of words about God, causes a problem because once we begin to see in modern science that the universe functions according to laws, 
There's nothing else for son for God to do. What we have to do is to respect the God, respect the fact that God remains completely outside the world, and He's the creator of the world. So that although I can explain everything in the world in terms of scientific causes, God nevertheless can simultaneously be giving a different kind of causality. And that uh, that uh, prevents us from falling into that uh, either or situation that we face, in, that we see in a lot of dialogue today. So what we end up with is having to say that we use words about God analogically. And to say that we use words about God analogically is that they're in some ways the same and in some ways different. So that when I say my dog knows me, my wife knows me, and God knows me, there is a sense of cognition where my dog does in fact know me, a sense of cognition where my wife knows me, and God certainly knows me. But they know me in three different ways. My dog knows me as the one who gives him treats. My wife knows me as the one to whom she is betrothed. And, uh, God knows me as the one he created to fulfill my own mission on earth. And so we have to always keep this in mind, that when we speak about God, we speak about God analogically. This keeps God in a proper distance of transcendence and mystery because we never quite nail down exactly what God is. At the same time, it gives us an intimacy and familiarity with God because he really is like the creatures in that he creates in having these perfections that we discuss. Um, and this, this is something that St. Augustine pointed out long ago where he said that if you, uh, if you ever comprehend something, then what you're comprehending is not God because God can never be fully comprehended by man. Okay, so having said that, what sort of evidence is available for the existence of God on the basis of reason? Reason is the attempt to know the causes of why things happen. So the birth of philosophy and the birth of reason in Western civilization was marked by a transition from mythological explanations to philosophical or logical explanations. If there were a hurricane or a tidal wave in ancient Greece, in 600 BC they would have said, well, it's Neptune or Zeus or something. By the time you get to the philosophers, they're trying to find a natural explanation for why there's a hurricane or a tidal wave. They're trying to find a cause for what happens. Science will always find a cause for what happens based upon something that they can empirically prove, right? So science sees something going on and they'll postulate the existence of a chemical or a particle or a force, but then that chemical or particle or force is something they can go back and isolate and experiment on to prove that this is exactly what's going on. So if you're doing a chemistry experiment, why does this liquid turn red? Well, you can eventually isolate whatever the, 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 the compound is in the chemical that causes it to turn red under these conditions. So if we can ask three basic questions, how would science answer them? What are things made of? Well, things are made of molecules, and molecules are made of atoms, and atoms are made up of quarks, and according to one contemporary theory, quarks are made up of vibrating strings of energy in 11 dimensions, right? All of which are at least theoretically, empirically isolatable, so you can experiment them and find them. Second question is, well, how do we know that this is the way the world is? And they, they look at the way that the human uh, uh, central nervous system is designed, and they say, well, we can know because there are neurochemical impulses that trans transmit information to the brain, and that at some point the brain makes sense of this experience that we've had, so that it's, it's this neurochemical relationship. Thirdly, you can ask, well, why do things act? And they say, well, things act because there are laws of nature, like gravity or entropy, there are the rules of physics, uh, Einstein's formula, the laws of chemistry, and or for living things, biological instinct. So that things are always acting based upon some sort of scientifically provable um, uh, suggestion about biology, chemistry, or physics. God, obviously, is not available in any of these for the simple fact that God is not an empirically given datum. He is not a thing in the universe. Rather, God is the cause of all that is, and so he's outside the universe. But this does not mean that reason cannot get to knowledge of God. 
It simply means that we have to use a different method and ask slightly different questions to get to our understanding of God. And that this is where philosophy comes in. Philosophy, like science, begins with observing the physical universe. But in observing the physical universe, it seeks a necessary intelligible principle, a necessary principle that explains why everything else is the case. Philosophy as a whole, this is the most fruitful way I've found to describe it. It says, why does the world make sense? Science has to assume that the world makes sense. If the scientist didn't assume that the world didn't make sense, he would never enter into a life of experiment. Right? If he thought that the world would undergo radical changes from day to day, or if he thought that his own capacities to know would fail from moment to moment, he would never enter into that rigorous life of experiment. But science can't explain why the world makes sense, because that's what it must assume. Philosophy, on the other hand, tries to explain why the world makes sense. And it does this by trying to find first principles or ultimate explanations behind everything else. So to take those three questions we had just gone through a moment ago, we cannot ask the question again, what are things made of, right? And, and things are made of atoms and quarks and strings and so forth. But philosophy would say, well, no, things are made of matter. But if you think about it, matter didn't have to exist. Everything that's material, indeed matter itself, there's nothing necessary about its existence. And we, in fact, know this is a scientific fact because of the Big Bang. Right? The Big Bang is that which constituted matter from, from what was a point of singularity before that. So matter itself is contingent. So matter can't be the explanation about why things exist. So the only thing, ultimately, that can explain why things that, that exist has to be a principle of existence itself. And this principle of existence itself is what Thomas will call the act of existence, the actus ascendi. And that this act of existence is the cause of all that is. And we can simply call it being. Right? So that there is something that is just being. And being explains why everything else exists. If something has being, it exists. If something lacks being, it's nothing. And if it's nothing, it's nowhere in our experience of the universe. So that being is the principle that ties all of our experience together. Now, again, this is not something that science can get to. Science assumes the reality of being. Philosophy, though, in Aristotle's famous words, will be a science of being as being, simply as things existing. Secondly, how can we know this? Well, science would go to the idea that there's a series of neurochemical impulses in our brain. But are neurochemical impulses really the same as consciousness? There seems to be a qualitative difference between a neurochemical impulse, which is a specific, discrete event in the brain, and the idea of consciousness, which is limited neither by time nor by space, so that I can witness a just act, but I can also conceive of the notion of justice that applies to every just act in every case. This is why we have to say that there's something to knowing the world other than these neurochemical impulses. And what this knowing the world other than neurochemical impulses is the mind. The mind makes judgments about our sense experiences. Science can explain why I have a sense experience, right? They put you in an MRI, they show you pictures, right? And they'll show parts of your brain lighting up. They can explain how I have sense experience. But the fact is, in my sense experience, I make certain judgments that can't be, be uh, described in terms of sense experience. So for example, the idea of identity. So the idea, idea of identity is one thing is the same through time. But if I look at Sal, my old friend in the front row here, if I look at him, I have one discrete sense experience, and I look back, I have another discrete sense experience. How do I know that that's the same? I can't know that that's the same based upon another sense experience, because another sense experience would just be number three, and another one would be number four. To say that it's the same has to refer to something that's not merely a sense experience. And what makes, what allows me to say that it's the same is that the mind makes judgments about these sense experiences. And so 
what we're getting at here is that the mind doesn't just put me in relation to the sense experience, but it puts me in relation to the way the world actually is. And it puts me in relationship to the truth. So that philosophy doesn't just ex examine being, it examines how I can know being. And the way that we know being is the truth. Sense experience can only tell me the world as it appears to me. But we always make judgments about those appearances, and that's what philosophy gets to. How can I make judgments about these appearances? The third thing, why do things act? Yes, things act according to physical laws and chemical laws, but in addition to that, things act because they seek to perfect themselves. Things act because they're always seeking to achieve some final, some, some final goal. Apple trees are growing, grow roots, they grow leaves, they grow bark, they grow in height, so that they can grow apples. Human beings do everything they can do in order to achieve happiness. So that we see that things just aren't caused to act by physical processes, rather things act because they seek something that is perfective, and that this is the good. Things act because what they seek is the good, and that everything in the universe is ordered to the idea of achieving something that is good for it. Again, science can't make that value judgment. Science can tell us whether or not something is a fact. Whether or not that fact is good is a completely different thing. And you have to judge good with respect to does it or does it not perfect the nature of this creature or perfect the nature of this universe. So that this is what philosophy does. And in each of these ways, we can use it to get to God. We see that the universe, and Baron went over these, so I'll, I'll go over these very briefly. The universe itself didn't have to exist. Everything in the universe is contingent. So that the universe doesn't have being necessarily. Because it doesn't have being necessarily, there has to be, be something prior to it that gives it being. And that which is prior to it, if it was, itself was brought into existence, doesn't have being necessarily, so that you eventually have to hit some being that has being necessarily of its nature, and that this is what God is. God is the pure act of existence. God is the being that gives existence or being to everything else. But if God is this pure act of existence, he will not be limited in any way, right? A limitation is a due any limitation is due to a kind of contingency. And so because God is not limited in any way, a series of truths follow from this. And St. Thomas draws these out in the first 11 questions of the Summa. That because God is being himself, he is perfect. Because he's perfect, he's good. Because he's perfect, he's infinite. Because he's infinite, he's omnipresent, right? So he's not limited anywhere. And again, how can he be omnipresent? Because he's not a creature in the universe, but he's outside of it, holding it into existence at all times. Because God is perfect, he's also unchanging. Because if he were to change, he would either be changing from imperfect to perfect or perfect to imperfect. Both of those are impossible. Because God is unchanging, he's completely outside of time. Because time is a measurement of change. And finally, there can only be one God because uh, if there's, uh, in order to have two beings, they have to be different in some way. But to be different than perfect being, you can only be imperfect being. But that's creatures, imperfect being. So that we know that God is this perfect act of existence and there can only be one of them. We can then say, well, how does God act? If God is this being, what sort of activities does, does, must he do? Well, because God is uh, omnipresent, it follows, one of the things that follows is that he's immaterial, right? Because any material thing is located in a specific space. But because God is everywhere, he's not made of matter. And if we're going to talk about God's actions, we have to consider, well, what sort of actions does an immaterial being have? And simply by reflecting on our own existence, we know that. So think about your own reality, your own person. What activities you, do you do where you grow and constantly change in activity, and yet it doesn't affect your physical being? 
And these are the powers of intellect and will, to know and to love. An immaterial being is a rational being, and a rational being is one that has the powers of reason, of, of intellect, to know and will to love. So we can ask, how does God know the world? Well, we know the world by observing it, right? So I, there are some of you I've never met before, and so if I come to meet you tonight, I will know you because I've observed the world and I've come to know it. But of course, God doesn't know by observing the world. God knows because he created the world. And because he created the world, he defines all truth. Right? I get to know a truth passively by receiving it. But God is the one who determines the truth because he creates it. This is brought uh, out very well both by St. Augustine and St. Thomas by reflecting on the prologue to St. John's Gospel, where in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things came to be through the Word, and nothing came to be without it. Right? The idea that things came to be through the Word, the Word in Greek is logos, logic, reason. So that this is the idea that God is the determiner of truth. So that God doesn't just give being to the world, but he gives an intelligible order to the world because he created through the word, through reason, and through logic. So the world didn't have to make sense, but God created it through the world so it does make sense because it's logical and orderly. Moreover, we can ask, well, why does God create at all? When we act, out of will, we are always trying to perfect ourselves. We are seeking a good. So if I'm hungry, I seek a good apple to eat because that would better perfect me. If I'm lonely, I seek a good friend to talk to because that lifts me up in virtue. And if I want to really perfect myself, I seek God because in knowing God, I know my ultimate destiny. So that when we will ourselves to act, we're always seeking a good that we lack. But of course, God doesn't lack any goodness. He's, he's the perfect being itself. So why does God act at all? Why did God create? And we know that God created because it was an utterly gratuitous act of love. He created us simply to share his goodness with us. He's perfect in his goodness, and he created it because he wants to share that goodness with us. And because he wants to share that goodness with us, he realizes that perfect goodness lies in himself. So he doesn't just create us and leave us to our own purposes. He creates us with a natural inclination back to him as the one who fulfills all our desires. So that, how do we know this? Human beings have a natural desire to know the truth and to love the good. And yet in this world I find finite truths. In this world I find finite good things. They satisfy me partially. But I understand that the ultimate truth and ultimate good, that which really satisfies me, is only found in God. So that when God creates the universe, he creates it to share his goodness, but in sharing his goodness, he also directs us back to him. So we come to the conclusion that because God is this perfect being, he's also a personal being. Right? It's important to say God is not a person, right? That's a uh, Unitarian heresy, and that I'm afraid. I've, I heard from a, a well-respected professor that that only came about, the idea that God is a person only emerged in like the 19th century with the Unitarians. But God is personal. God is three persons. So that he is a knowing and loving being. And that this knowing and loving being not only gives us being, it allows us to know that he allows us to know the truth and it directs us back to himself as the full fulfillment of my being. Uh, I was uh, recently heard somebody say, it's very comforting to know that God loves us just because we are. And I thought that's a nice sentiment, but it completely misses the point. And I think it's much more profound to think that we are simply because God loves us, right? Our whole existence lies in God's act of love by which we come into being. And all God wants for us is to perfect that being by being ordered back to him. And so he gives us the tool of reason by which we can know all these things. And that this is what Thomas Aquinas calls the virtue of religion. The virtue of religion is something that's shared by all people. And because all people, if they discipline reason well enough, 
can know all these things I just told you. They understand that there is a duty to offer homage to God. That offering homage to God is the virtue of religion. And so that religion is something that should be honored in all people. But this is where the Christian faith takes up. So that where other religions are man-made attempts to offer homage to God, with faith, what we have is the gift of revelation that tells us the perfect understanding of God. It's not our attempt to offer homage and kind of, you know, with an imperfect idea of God. It's God telling him, telling us of his very own nature by which we're ordered back to him. Now, the first thing to see here is against a lot of the modern atheists, faith is not a leap in the dark. Right? The, the Lutheran philosopher Soren Kierkegaard, who's very edifying to read, he's a very interesting philosopher, but he's the one who uh, popularized this idea of the leap of faith. Well, the only reason he argued for a leap of faith is because he followed Kant's metaphysics, and he assumed that we couldn't know God. But I've argued here that in the mystic tradition, we can know God. Faith, recall, we recall that we need faith for two reasons. So that those things that we can know, everybody can know without any error, so that it's not just the philosophers who know these things about God, but even the farmer who's working in the field. But more importantly, there are the mysteries about God, the Trinity, the Incarnation, the Resurrection, the Pentecost, the Virgin Birth, that reason can never get to. Two equals four, because I can do a mathematical proof and break down this one plus one plus one plus one. And I can prove that two plus two equals four. I can know that God exists because I can have proof that God exists based upon those arguments that we had talked about a moment ago. Opinion has no certainty at all because there is no demonstration. So I have the opinion that the Saints will go to the Super Bowl again this year. Would I be willing to bet any money on that Not at this point? Right? Um, right? So I have an opinion that it's going to rain tomorrow. Do I know that for a fact? No, right? So I'm certain two plus two equals four. I'm certain God exists. I'm certain that there's a podium here. Opinion is something I have no certainty. And just think about those things that you're willing to say, well, this is what I think, but I admit that I'm not certain. Faith is in between because faith has certainty even though it lacks demonstration. Faith is something where, think of the way we say the creed, I believe in God. Right, the Father the Almighty, that you believe in it and you have utter certainty with it. I believe in Jesus Christ. I have certainty even though there's no proof for it. It is, as St. Augustine argued, to think with assent. To think with this unqualified and unconditional sense, this I believe even though there's no proof for it. Now, the key to this belief is that you have to, you're not believing the statement, you're believing the one who tells you. This is again a place where modern philosophy gets it all wrong. Modern philosophy likes to take a statement, take it out of context, and then try and prove the statement. But statements of belief can't be taken out of context because you believe the one who told you. So that if somebody comes to me, if a stranger comes up to me and says, the world's going to end tomorrow, I'm just going to shrug it off. I'm not going to offer any, you know, that, that I don't believe you. If Pope Francis were to say that he had a vision and the world's going to end tomorrow, I offer belief, right? So I believe the one who is telling me, not what is said. This is important for faith because I've argued that we can know God exists. We can know that he's a personal being. We can know that he is the truth. We can know that he loves us. And for all these things, I will believe what he said to me. And what he says to me is the Bible, the revelation that we're given. So because I know all these, what Thomas calls preambles to the faith, that all these other truths about God, I'm, I'm willing to give my faith to that. Chesterton, in his autobiography, kind of pokes fun at this idea that we have to prove everything and there's no such thing as faith. And so the first line of his autobiography is, bowing down in blind credulity, as is my custom, before mere authority and the tradition of the elders, superstitiously swallowing a story I could not test at the time by experiment or by private judgment, I am firmly of the opinion that I was born on the 29th of May, 1874. Right? This is, right? How do I know my birth?
birthday is when it was. I can't test that. I believe my mother. Why? Because she's my mom. Right? And that this is, this is the way that faith works. You have a loving relationship with somebody. Because you have that loving relationship, you're willing to grant credence to that which they tell you. In fact, Cardinal Newman said, we believe because we love. But because we love, we know God and we love him. We are willing to make that act of faith. Now, having said that, right, you don't, you look at the person who's telling you, but you also have to put it in accord with everything else you know. Right? And Thomas brings this up at the beginning of the Summa Country of Tilles, where he contrasts the revelation of Islam with the revelation of Christianity. And based upon everything we know about God on the basis of reason, the revelation of Islam just doesn't seem to work because that God is a God of a warlord and, uh, uh, who is vindictive in killing and so forth. So uh, you have to take the revelation or whatever somebody says and put it in the context of everything else you know so that uh, even if you know, sometimes my mother would uh, make a mistake. And so although I'm willing to create belief to my mother in many things, there are some things she would tell me and I'd say, well, that's so out of context that I don't think it, it could be the case. And we, again, we all know that experiment. So it's, it's juggling that love based upon our relationship with somebody in the background knowledge of what we know that makes it uh, believable. Now, the last question here is, well, how can we have certainty without a demonstration? And Thomas says the reason we have certainty, right, so that if something is proved, I just, I can't help but agree with it. Two plus two equals four. Yes, I see. There's a podium here. Yes, I see. If you're certain about something, you can't help but agree. What allows us, without a demonstration, without absolute proof, to grant certainty or to our faith? And Thomas says, that's because faith is an act of the will. And what does the will desire? The will desires the good. And so I can have certainty because I can see that it is good for me to accept this thing on faith. It fulfills my natural inclination to know the absolute truth. I want to know the ultimate cause of that which is. Philosophy tells me that there is a God. Revelation tells me who this God is. And I can see that it's good for me to put myself in a relationship, a personal relationship with that God. And so I've been willing to make the act of faith because it's good, right? The intellect is ordered to the truth. The will is ordered to the good. And faith is simply where we see it's good to believe this truth for us. The alternative, the, the denial of faith, is simply to say that man's natural inclination to know the ultimate cause is utterly futile, and that therefore life has no point. If that which we most want to know can never be known and can never be given to us, then life, again, is something, um, that, that life is something that wouldn't be worth living because it would have no ultimate fulfillment. where we can conclude and show the continuity of faith and reason. Philosophy brings us to the fact that God is the one true good being. What theology tells us, what revelation and faith tells us is who this one true good being is in the person of Christ. And that where philosophy is the habit of contemplating the idea of truth and goodness and being, Theology is the habit of forming a personal relationship with Christ as the one who embodies that one true good being. And that this personal knowledge then uh, ends up being the ultimate fulfillment of what we know. Thomas says that in this world, it is better to believe in God, excuse me, I'm sorry. In this world, it's better to love God than to know Him. Because we never have complete knowledge of God in this world. And so where knowledge falls off in this world, we have to love. We have to love the good, and we have to accept revelation. So in this world, it's better to love God than to know Him. But in heaven, where we get the full direct beatific vision, the knowledge of God is better than the love of Him. But that is something that's waiting for some point later. Thank you.
The, uh, the call of the new evangelization is, of course, a call to proclaim the, the good news of Christ, the incarnate goodness, beauty, and truth of God incarnate in the, the divine Son, Jesus Christ, given to us. Um, which also means that we have to know some of the challenges and presuppositions of, of this age, this time, and in particular of this culture. Um, so I, I now open up the, the floor uh, for a, a few questions. We'll take maybe maybe 10 minutes, uh, 10 or 12 minutes of questions. If you'd like to, to go to either of the two, two microphones here. Um, kind of take a take a breath, and if you can get it in one breath, that's good. And if you wouldn't mind going to the, the microphone, that'll be helpful because we can hear the question, which will kind of then uh, lead us to the answer. And Dr. Jacobs, like I said, will take about ten minutes to be able to answer something. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I was a little confused by that last thing you said, uh, how it's going to be in the other world as opposed to how it is in this world right at the end. Right. Can you explain that again? Um, yeah. It's question of, um, in this world, uh, it, it's a question of, um, when we uh, when we know God, the question is, do we know him in his fullness? And even with Revelation, we don't know God, we don't, we don't know God in all his fullness. That only comes with the beatific vision. And so, in this world, because whatever we have is a kind of incomplete knowledge of God, even with Revelation, we, we, it's better to understand that this is incomplete and have an act of love by which I desire to complete that. Whereas in the next world, in the, with the beatific vision, my desire for knowledge is completely satiated. And so therefore, because it's completely satiated, the love doesn't have to outstrip my knowledge. The love and my love and knowledge are co-equal at that point. So it has, it has to do with the limitations of knowledge in this world. Because even Revelation, right, even Revelation comes to us historically mediated and linguistically mediated. And whatever we have, we, we can understand that God is Trinity, but we still don't understand what that means. A couple Sundays ago, we had Trinity Sunday. And I, I always pity uh, priests on Trinity Sunday because <laughs> it's, it's a mystery. And how do you, how do you explain it? Well, we can talk about it, but we can't explain it. Whereas in the beatific vision, we have more direct intuition of what that means. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Um, you spoke about why do things act? Yes. And um, you said that things act in order to perfect themselves to reach a greater good. Is that correct? And I was thinking about evolution how there's um, many creatures throughout evolution that lost more, more good characteristics in order to be able to adapt to their environment. So uh, even humans and other creatures were in a sense more perfect biologically, but had to, or rather evolved, to have a trait that was less perfect or less good in order to be able to, to live in their environment. How would you explain that? Well, um that's, it's, it's a difficult question. I think, on the one hand, when you look at cosmic history, and evolution is part of cosmic history, the, the idea that the good of cosmic history is not necessarily the good of every creature nor of any species, because we know that 96% of all species are now extinct, something like that, right? Um, so that the idea that the, the adaptation to a biological niche is, in fact, I mean, you're, you're presuming a kind of better and worse that may or may not be the case. So that, say, uh, uh, whales at one point existed on land with legs. They went back to the ocean and they, they evolved into flippers. Well, are legs better than flippers, right? Where, there's, where there is a marked difference is the difference between non-life and life, plant and animal, animal and man. And man, you know, once you make that ascent, I don't think it ever, I don't think those ever go bad, right? So that you might have particular species in order to adapt to a biological niche, which are changing, but you can't really say they're better or worse. And indeed, in as much as they're continuing to survive, the, the, the ultimate goodness is being itself. And so just continue to exist is in fact goodness. And so that evolutionary adaptation is good, even if they had to sacrifice something in the process. But what we can't assume is that man would sort of revert from being rational, or plants, would, or excuse me, animals would revert to, to 
Does that make sense? So I, I think that in terms of cosmic history, the goal of cosmic history is the good of the universe, and in terms of any given species, you have to judge it kind of differently with respect to any one power and just see how they adapt. said earlier, Dr. Jacobs, uh, science has to assume that the world makes sense. And it reminded me of a quote by G.K. Chesterton when he said that reason is itself a matter of faith and that it's an act of faith to assert that um, our thoughts have any relation to reality at all. And so I wanted to ask if in some of, uh, it seems a lot of the attacks on the, um, you know, the debates on God that uh, there are those that are very hostile to religious faith. So do they accept any sort of faith like other matters of existence where it seems like they do without acknowledging it, or how would we maybe argue that well, do they do maybe in some ways accept faith, but just not in religious connotations? Yeah, that, that's, a, I mean, that's a big question. I think certainly we do, so that anytime you accept the testimony of another, you're accepting something on faith. So an example I always like to bring up is whenever you land at Louis Armstrong Airport and says, welcome to New Orleans, how do you know you're actually in New Orleans? In fact, you're in Canada. Uh, how, do you, how, do you, how do you know you're in Northern? You're accepting the testimony of others. And even these great atheists, um, you know, they might be scientists, but they have to accept all sorts of testimony from others because there's no way that you can prove everything themselves. So that, that is uh, a very important point, uh, that there is testimony that they accept. I think a bigger question here is that the kind of skepticism about the limits of reason and that it's a striking fact that in the last 30 years, the two, two greatest defenders of reason in the public life have been John Paul II and Pope Benedict, because they've understood that reason cannot be restricted to science. They both constantly argued about that. And that the whole problem with the atheists is that they want to restrict knowledge to a very small area, but that's ultimately inhuman. Because if you restrict knowledge to mere scientific fact, well, then you can't know any value. And if you can't know any value, then our moral lives and the meaning of life itself is ultimately arbitrary. Edmund Husserl, who was a, a philosopher, he's probably an atheist himself, but he said, he had, he had a great attack on that idea where he said, merely fact-minded sciences make for merely fact-minded people. And merely fact-minded people are very good with data, but data is never self-interpreted. You always need some background value judgments by which to make sense of data. And these scientists simply say that that can't count as knowledge. Or if they can't count as knowledge, I don't know how you can live a human life. Because a human life isn't merely data. We're not robots. Rather, we're people who make judgments about data based upon certain values. This was a great attack of, in the early 20th century, there was a movement to turn politics into political science. Right? I mean, most, I think, colleges probably have departments of political science. Now, the difference between politics and political science is that politics in Aristotle is the second half of his ethics. Politics is about achieving the good for a country or the good for a city-state. Political science is a value-free interpretation of data, right? So you do demographic tests to see how you'll get the most people to vote for you. And there's no values there. The problem with that is that even political science assumes that there's some good. And what it assumes is that it's good to have people vote for you, right? And so although it claims to be value-free, you're just surreptitiously importing another set of values, typically Machiavellian values and crass values, into political science for your own purposes. And so I think that, that hey, science is wonderful, and, and, and I thank God every time I go to the doctor that we have science. but Science alone is not adequate to answer these great questions, and the meaning of life are these larger questions that we need to address. Hi, I just have a quick question. Um, you mentioned that there are some habit of forming relationships with Christ, and I missed what you said philosophy was. Well, philosophy is a habit of contemplating Philosophy is a habit of contemplating the ultimate principles being truth and goodness. Right, so from purely philosophical understanding, Plato, Aristotle, even Augustine and Aquinas contemplated what it meant to be being, what it meant to be true, what it meant to be good. What we get with Revelation is that those 
truths, those principles are embodied in the person of Christ uh, uh, as the second person of the Trinity. We'll take uh, one more question, and then we'll go ahead and uh, briefly conclude. We'll have uh, uh, Father Gary and Father Christian offer us a blessing before we leave. It's probably going to be more question. <laughs> I think you've uh, made mention a couple times this evening about science being purely just a purely just a fact-based uh, around us and that has nothing to offer insofar as value-based judgments occur and attain. One of the you know the, the new atheists, Sam Harris, had a book, I think it was in 2005, about the moral landscape where he actually makes just that claim that science can in fact tell us what to do. Morally speaking, if he, define, he defines what is moral as the preservation of the well-being of a species, and through scientific study, we know what uh, certain species need to thrive, and therefore that being a proper sense of morality. I was just wondering your comments on that. Well, that that's the great vogue um, in academia these days. So when I was in college, the the prism was always Marxism. You interpreted everything through Marxism. Evolutionary psychology is the great prism through which a lot of contemporaries will interpret things so that everything they do they try to argue that well this was evolutionarily relevant um, so that in recent years there have been, been, book, excuse me, been books on ethics as evolutionary um, beauty as evolutionary the guy argued that the reason why we like certain kinds of paintings is because our ancestors saw landscapes that animals typically uh, grazed on I should, uh, uh, other people have argued that religion uh, is evolutionary. In fact, Robert Bella has a new book out about that. The problem is that at the very beginning, I argued that why do we act? And that scientists reduce things to atoms, quarks, and here it simply means genes, right? We act because of genes. And that's, that's simply um, an inadequate explanation. To say that religion is evolutionary adaptive really misses the point because we do a lot of things that are contrary to evolutionary. Think of the martyrs, right? Uh, martyrdom is contrary to the good of the species from an evolutionary perspective. Asceticism, celibacy, are contrary to the good of the species from the perspective of evolution. Similarly with art, right? I, I, art has no purpose, which is what makes it so liberating, right? It's one of the liberal arts because you do it as an end in itself, not because it has any purpose. And that, the only way they can argue this is by misunderstanding or misinterpreting the real nature of the activity in question. Um, and, and also with respect to ethics. I mean, uh, we understand ethically, the people in this room understand that ethically it's wrong to kill a helpless individual. Other people in our society have followed that evolutionary argument and are arguing that it's good to kill a helpless individual. But just the fact that there's a debate about that the fact that we posit a, a, an understanding of goodness that's so distant from uh, the evolutionary good of the species is a sign that they, they certainly don't have it right. And we can go into that.